friends, and welcome to Conversations with Consequences. We are the ladies of the Catholic Association, bringing you witty and charming in-depth conversation on the topics that matter to you with the leading thinkers and movers of our time. Conversations with Consequences is part of the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Our radio show is always a podcast, and you can listen by going to thecatholicassociation.org slash podcasts, or you can just go directly to wherever you listen to your podcasts. I'm your hostess, Dr. Gracie Christie, and once again, thank you very much for joining us this week. We are so happy at Conversations at the Catholic Association that you take the time to listen, and we do get some feedback, and we get a lot of positive feedback, so I know that we are having, we're pleasing some people out there and pleasing some hearts, and thank you for letting us be part of your conversations, your conversations with your families and and your friends, because I know that all the topics that we touch upon, I hope all the topics that we touch upon are topics that you yourselves are finding interesting and topics of good conversations. Welcome to the show, Dr. Majors. Great to be here, Gracie. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you for taking time out of your work day, which I know you must be uh, very good at organizing and getting all the all the optimal uh, things out of it, since that is what you do <laughs> yes. for a living. <laughs> I know, it's like exactly. I teach it to the people. But yeah. still, I mean, you do. You have many balls in the air. You teach uh, residents in psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. You have your own private practice in Boston. You have your whole program of optimal work that we want to hear all about. And you're like a lot of us, right, that are doing many things at the same time and have wearing lots of hats. Is that mm-hmm. is that something that people these days, is that what many of us are struggling with? Because I feel like that's my one of my big struggles in life is balancing all the many aspects of my work that seem to pull me in so many different directions. For me, the key thing is never try to do two things at one time. So I have, and what optimal work helps people to do is to practice a kind of mindfulness in their life. And in work, what that looks like is what I call sequential unitasking. So just doing one thing at a time and giving that thing your entire attention. And then if an interruption comes up, that's fine. It doesn't have to break your attention. You just give your attention entirely to the interruption until you can finish it. And you bring your attention fully back. I'm yeah. sorry, that seems to go against the that whole myth of the multitasking woman. She's changing a diaper with one hand and flipping an egg with the other and, and doing her thesis with her, yeah. <laughs> with her non-existent yeah. third hand. How does that... That, so that's a wrong, that's a wrong approach, the multitasking. Yeah, there can be a way in which what the person is practicing is a kind of flexibility and intensity in their attention. Mm-hmm. And even though they're doing many things, they could really be doing one thing. And in some ways, the more spiritual people get, the more they're doing one thing all day long. Mm-hmm. So they're just doing what they see as the will of God. So it feels like unitasking always. That's beautiful. And they, yeah, and then they do. So the, the, the more our in, intention is practiced in seeking that like divine something, as St. Josemaria would say, the quid divinum, you know, in every activity, then the better we get at actually turning our entire day into just one thing. Wow, that's very beautiful. So that's why we wake up in the morning and we offer our day and we make everything we do that day a prayer and, yes. and with one intention. Oh, that is beautifully yeah, that, unified. So that, that, yes, yeah, so that, that's the idea of the kind of unity of life that we're mm-hmm. pursuing. And the moment you wake up is so crucial. So I really encourage people to, I say jump out of bed. I don't mean literally jump out of bed and everything. <laughs> but but the, what's our attitude towards the day? Mm-hmm. Do we have an excitement to give our best in it and to try to be loving every every challenge that comes along that day as a gift from like our encouraging Father God mm-hmm. so that he is giving us the very challenges we need to become the person he wants us to be. And if we lovingly embrace them, you know, challenge by challenge, then we are growing and we get a momentum that is very energizing. But that is too beautiful, Dr. Majors, because most people, including me, a lot of the time, we see see our day as an obstacle course with oh, yeah. with fatigue you know a, fa- a fatigued of uh, falling into bed at the end and and hopefully some rest before we start our, our next daily obstacle course and that that's entirely the wrong approach right well it's like if you were um you know going hiking and you haven't been used to hiking you know how do you relate to the soreness that will come mm-hmm. the best thing really is to be like seeing that the soreness that will come through engaging in this hike is actually my that's my muscles growing that soreness doesn't have to be experienced as something bad. Every day should stretch us, like to grow in any beautiful quality, any ideal. You need a difficulty that you're embracing, and then there's a facility in doing it that keeps growing. Mm -hmm. So all day long, we're actually habituating ourselves to difficulties by lovingly embracing them. And when you do that, it gets easier and easier. If the difficulty is anxiety, well, the more you embrace it and engage things, 
the more it habituates. And then the facility of doing those things gets better and better. So everything I teach people in optimal work is really about understanding how to undo vicious cycles, which come from avoidance and complaining, and instead engage in virtuous cycles that come from engaging challenges and reframing them as opportunities. So let's 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 introduce our listeners to optimal work if they haven't had the the good luck to already have run across it. Uh, so optimal work is is a whole program, right, of study and experience and even coaching where you reframe your approach to work. So you don't see the challenges at work as these terrible obstacles, but as, as embracing them, you are able to find a more fulfilling and productive life. Uh, yeah, that's really well said. So optimal work is a platform for teaching people a new way of engaging life and challenges. It's not really just about work mm -hmm. and it's not about productivity, which is how it's often seen. Mm -hmm. But instead, it's about how do you um, face the challenges that come up throughout the day in a positive way so that you get a good momentum from them. As long as a challenge feels external to us, it's really, it drains us of energy. And the more we learn to internalize the challenge and embrace it and find a positive thing to stretch for, energizing. So really, optimal work is about using your workday to shape you into being the best version of yourself so that when you come home, you can give your best to your loved ones. Or if you're working at home all day long, it still applies. So it's not just for people in an office job. It can be done anywhere. We talk about a golden hour as the fundamental unit of growth. Just thinking like, what are you doing in the next hour? And what are the challenges that will come? And how do you engage them in a way that stretches you using some vision in your mind? What would be the most beautiful way of growing here? That's the idea of a golden hour. You just set up what you're about to do in advance. And it can be done by anyone in any kind of setting. Or you can use our platform and then we walk you through the steps and that makes it easier too. Um, so, so I hear, I keep hearing you refer to a, a sort of an overarching ideal, pegging, yeah. pegging your workday, and you've said it in three or four different ways, but pegging your workday to not the completion of a list of tasks, but to the, to, to some higher ideal to which we are, we anchor things. If, if I'm saying this correctly, and also, mm -hmm. and you also meant you haven't mentioned this, but in your website about service to others and yeah. bringing bringing everyone along with you in your process. Now, yeah. this is a much bigger view and much more beautiful and noble and, and dignified view of work than as you know, sort of a punishment from God because we can't all lay, <laughs> we can't all laze around yes. and look at our Instagram all day. <laughs> Yeah. So tell me about that pegging of ideals, that, the, that overarching purpose. Yeah. So it gets into what is the essence of reframing. So reframing means, is this, this is what cognitive therapy is. So I had the, the great fortune of being trained at the Beck Institute for Cognitive Therapy by Aaron Beck himself and his daughter. And they have really pioneered and done research in every psychological disorder at this point. And the gold standard treatment is cognitive therapy. And the, I think the essence of cognitive therapy is learning how how to reframe so that whatever automatically appeared negative to us, because we get stuck in what's called threat mode, we learn to deliberately widen the view for it to see how is this really giving me a chance to grow? So it's like you pay attention to the things you complain about. Mm -hmm. The only thing we complain about are challenges. Mm -hmm. And we complain about the challenges that are the most essential to our growth. We have to widen the view to see how is, is there any way I can approach this challenge that would get, make, the, make the whole thing easier or even enjoyable? Mm. Could I see this challenge as not an obstacle course, but like a gymnasium? And when there's resistance and it's hard, that's really precisely where I'm growing the most. And then the content of reframing really is, is there a skill or an a virtue or a bond that I can deepen and grow in by the way I approach this activity and this challenge. And it's very beautiful as you see like the skills that come into, like just think about the most granular level skills of um, how to break down your tasks into smaller things, how to make the best use of small blocks of time, you know, how to cognitively switch from one task to another. These are all skills. Mm -hmm. But those skills, they end up becoming parts of virtues, like order and intensity and constancy. And as you go higher in the list of ideals, you really end end up with love because every ideal is really a way of being loving. So it's actually about bonds in the end. So there's this kind of crescendo of how you can aim for growth and challenges, identifying the skill or the virtue or what we, we, talk, we talk about ideals and optimal work because that's what you're aiming for. And then the bonds you want to, you want to develop. So that's the idea is that every, we can, 
you know, and the faith actually by giving us a full context, the widest possible context, which is everything is the will of our, of our Father God, and everything can be lovingly embraced. Mm-hmm. You know, we don't have to figure out how it all makes sense. We just have to lovingly embrace it, and we will grow the way we're meant to. Well, tie this in for me. So you're talking about this, and you're reminding me of this wonderful idea that the people in our lives who we see as obstacles, uh, people who mm-hmm. who make our life a little miserable, that there's another way of seeing that, right? We can reframe them as people who sanctify us. Absolutely. And how, yeah. Tell us how our work, when we reframe it like this, sanctifies us. As we are aiming for higher and higher ideals in our work, essentially looking at how can this be transformed into love and service, we end up seeing that the deepest thing we contribute you know, is one, the humility in work, which is forgetting about ourselves and being willing to truly attend to the people around us and our ability to let those bonds develop and bring out our best. So when we have difficulties with people, we focus on the bond. We don't try to change their behavior. We try to make sure that every interaction brings out our best. And that's going to be what was most likely to bring out the other person's best as well. So we end up controlling only what we can control, you know, uh, which is our own our own behavior, what we're contributing. But every interaction we have with others is a chance to be forgetful of ourselves, attentive and generous to the other. And that becomes more and more the focus of our life, you know, which is just like you know, the church has always talked about the, the threefold path, you know, that it starts in the purgative way. And then it goes to the illuminative and the unitive. And that's actually, in a sense, all built into the approach that we teach in Optimal Work. First, break the bad habits that you have, you know, the, the multitasking, the uh, giving into distractions and checking things too frequently. And then really see how to stretch yourself in your work by building ideals in how you work. So you're shaping yourself and ultimately then growing in the one ideal of all ideals, which is love. So, you know, so that charity ends up being the thing you're aiming for in every task. So we're actually teaching people this kind of way of growing all the way to this unitive level where now everything is more intentionally done for love and that's the highest goal. Now this sounds very wonderful but what what do you say to the person whose work is boring, repetitive, mindless, doesn't seem to have an impact on anyone, he, that person doesn't doesn't engage with anybody so you know so many people are living very isolated lives in front of their computers. It's not like they're at work, you know, making life brighter for others. Maybe they're just engaging with their computer and with spreadsheets. How do we do that? How do we make our work a sanctifying thing in that situation? Well, if you if you if you think of how you engage a challenge, usually we automatically get focused on some kind of outcome, something tangible. You know what what I call the a transitive good. You know, and so the but there's something deeper there, which is how am I growing? What are the virtues that I'm growing in? What are the bonds I'm deepening? So any task can become, ha- contains this possibility of greater union with others and with God. Now, I, I wouldn't, this is kind of like a very hard general question because it could be that for this person, the challenge that they need to embrace is searching for other jobs. Oh, sure. <laughs> and, 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 and not having a fixed mindset with regard to their own skills. Mm-hmm. I think everyone should be in jobs where they are developing skills and virtues and bonds that are meaningful to them. And if you think you're not capable of that, I, you know, then you're going to be stuck and it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. So if you're eager to grow, you can outgrow a job. And then you do need to look for another. Well, well, let me ask you, what if you're trapped in, in a kind of work that is like that, that is in itself meaningless? Is there a way to tie that in with, I, with God's, I don't believe with there's God's any work. purposes? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I don't okay, think now there's I'm, any work that's meaningless. Maybe, I I'm think getting, every... uh, maybe I'm getting too philosophical. I was just, um, yeah. I was reading very recently a book, um, and I'm, I can't remember his name right now, but he's he's been beatified, I believe, a, a, a Jesuit priest who was in the working in the in some mine in uh, in the Gulag for many years, and he was able in he was able to tie in his meaningless work, which was in fact meaningless because he was being made to push rocks around, right, for the greater good of the Soviet Union. Um, he was able to tie that in with with God's uh, redemptive work. In other words, yeah. with a really, really high purpose, even though his work was yeah. very, very low. Yeah, exactly. This is, yeah, Walter Zizek. He Zizek, is a, thank you. I, can't, I, yeah, can, I can never remember how exactly. to pronounce his name. With God in Russia. Yes. And uh, He Leadeth Me. He Leadeth Me. Um, he has yeah. a chapter on work, which is spellbinding. Yeah. So we need to pay attention to the interior dimension of work. Mm-hmm. The exterior may seem meaningless or you may be serving people in slavery like he was. But interiorly, he learned to lovingly embrace the cross of each hour. Mm -hmm, So mm -hmm. he was exercising charity and growing his bond with God 
hour by hour. And when you are, when you've internalized the challenge, instead of just seeing this as something imposed from outside and now internally, you're, you're leaning in and stretching yourself, trying to put more love into what seems meaningless. Mm -hmm. That gives you growth that lasts forever. Mm -hmm. The growth and love that you accomplish hour by hour actually lasts eternally. Uh, the, the actual transitive goods that we produce in our work, you know, the finished products, all of those are going to fade and go to nothing. Mm -hmm. The interior growth in love is actually everlasting. And, and there's a, and supernatural, so to, a supernatural component to that, right? Because of the communion well, of saints and we are actually, mm -hmm, in, yeah. we are actually increasing um, the love of the world and the goodness of the yes. world and the glory of God even Yes, and there's the, no the, transient good to our work. Exactly. And the Catholic faith itself is perfect at reframing everything. Mm -hmm. So you can reframe the greatest challenges, suffering and death, and you can reframe the smallest things that would seem meaningless if you didn't have faith. But with faith, even the smallest challenges can be huge opportunities for loving God. So the, the, the light of the faith actually turns every challenge into something beautiful and embraceable. My, our listeners know this because I, I talk about my entire life on this on this radio show. Uh -huh. but my father died very recently of ALS, and the last uh, oh, I'm sorry. yes, it was very sad. But the last year, and especially the last few months of his life, were intensely were work intense um, for me and my mother and my siblings. And the it, and every moment of it was was about reframing. And and now yeah. now that he's gone. Um, all, and I tell people who are who are working so hard with with ailing relatives, with disabled children, mm -hmm. with whoever they have in their life that requires that intense kind of work. I keep telling them, you know, when when your loved one is gone, if it's an elderly parent, for instance, which should happen and it's natural, all that work that you put in will have will 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 gain its its meaning in your heart and in your mind. Yeah, the, all the exactly. framing will be done by God for you. <laughs> you don't have to reframe it. He'll go back and reframe it all for you. Yeah. So love is what makes every action resonate eternally. Mm -hmm. And learning how to put love into things means nothing is actually meaningless and no work is meaningless. Mm -hmm. That everything can be done with love for God. But we can also look for better opportunities of using our talents if that applies. So I, <laughs> if we're not slaves in the gulag, you mean? <laughs> yeah, see, exactly. So, you, 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 so I think in the one hand, like there's also a kind of an element where it's like a game. And you're like, okay, how do I do the best with what I have? How do I build my skills? How do I develop my character in stronger ways? But then ultimately the aim is how do I transform everything into love? So really, in a sense, what optimal work is aimed at is that kind of openness to transformation. And when you help people to reframe, you're actually helping them to live their faith, even though optimal work is secular. And so we don't, it's not specifically mentioning faith, but reframing itself, you see like the beauty of the faith that it helps us reframe the smallest challenge, the greatest challenge, mm -hmm. the shortest challenge, the longest mm -hmm. challenge, <laughs> you know, and then our own personal ones and then the communal and the whole world. The faith actually shines equally bright at every single level you can think of. Yes. And so the faith is what stabilizes reframing as a skill. So reframing becomes a skill and becomes actually the most constant way we live faith. We live mm -hmm. faith by seeing things in the context of our Father God. Every moment comes to us from his providence. And, and so I think that, that that is a sense in which you can see how the faith helps people with their mental health as well. Because it's not different for people who, are, who have mental illness. Everything can be reframed and the skills, they grow stronger and stronger with practice. So I think that the best way to build the skills of reframing and being more recollected and mindful and embracing challenges, the best thing is to develop that hour by hour, even just one hour a day where you try to craft it in advance. So it's something beautiful and positive and recollected that you build up these muscles that help you to then deal with the greatest challenges. So what you're suggesting in a sense is is a contemplative life, right? Like a life of exactly. contemplation in the midst of the world where you are, there's nothing in your, in your life, whether at home or at work, that is not... Um, that is not that, that that does not have supernatural implications yes. and meanings that that you can that you can wrap your whole heart around. Exactly. So we have a a master class on optimal work. See, optimal work is a way that people can do this on their own, mm -hmm. um, but they can you know in, we have entire companies who are doing the master class, and it's been a fantastic experience with with whole companies to do it to see how to transform the culture of that company. So, but the last day of our master class 
is about vital engagement, which is how do you stay in flow all day long? And in the end, it's by bringing your highest ideals into each small action day, all day long. Mm -hmm. So it is a contemplative goal in the end. When I was um, about, how old was I? I was maybe 31 or 32. I, I had my third child and and I went straight from residency to work. I didn't take a break for some crazy, mm. crazy reason. Yeah, and but- and then I had like a mini nervous breakdown and mm. it, it manifested itself by, I, I was I was extremely unhappy at work and I was making everyone around me miserable at work. Uh, yeah. And finally one day I went to work and I started to cry and I couldn't stop. And mm. I, I, I finally ended up quitting after a week or two of that. <laughs> nobody wanted me or mm-hmm. no, nobody wanted the crier at work. And, and I wasn't able, but uh, the reason I bring this up is because it was at that time that um, I fell in with, I, I got a, a little a holy card of San Jose Maria and the sanctification of work. So I tried very hard on my own um, for a few weeks or a month or two to, to understand that idea that, that my work was good, but in the end, that I could make it good and I could sanctify it. But in the end, I was, there was too much going on. I, I had too many babies at home and... Yeah. And I think what was calling me and what was breaking my heart is that I I'd been I'd been misbalancing my life and and neglecting my children. <laughs> so mm-hmm. so anyway, I quit and but I bring all this up because um there are some situations which just aren't fixable. Right? Like there's some situations that you can't uh you can't rebalance. You have to drastically um shift. And and well, I think that maybe the, that happens a lot to women. Yeah, the challenge many times maybe the courage to find a new job or mm-hmm. to, to or to quit so uh, reframing is always asking like how can this bring out the best in me how can the the circumstances of my life right now be the way you know, like that i become the person god wants me to be so it's not just coping with what's in front of you no it's it's thriving on on life as a whole so, and you might determine that the best thing for you right now is to set aside the work to be able to focus on raising your family. Mm-hmm. Well, that's an incredibly noble thing to do, you know, and it is completely um, generous. And so, I, so I think that there is many, you know, every bond does require us in some way to a new level of generosity. Yeah, and so as a, and a family's growing, you, you're, the generosity is being kind of asked of us more and more. And that's a very good thing to happen. So there are hard decisions to be made. And I don't have, in often work, we have no opinion on what's no, the best of way of solving <laughs> that. Yeah, yeah. And we've helped people to see letting go of their work as the right path. And we've helped people to actually get to the point where their work does bring out their best and energizes them so that when they're with their family, they feel like they are giving them their very best. So I think that there are you know, options open either way. Do you, do you find that a lot of women these days are caught in these terrible um, conundrums? Are you seeing that more in women and young women well, who have been told they could have it all and then they find you know, know. at 28 or 29 or 30 that they can't, in fact, have it all? <laughs> No, it's, it's yes, definitely. You know, that we, you know, there right now our culture is in a crisis of what to make of mothers. Mm-hmm. You know, and how do we value motherhood? Uh, and is is it what is the best thing to do um, when it comes to your career? And women have these impossible expectations. That I've seen in cases, you know, where people decide to stay home and then they have friends react very negatively to mm-hmm. that. And, and parents, like, so what, parents who invested yes. in their education. <laughs> exactly. And so there's all these pressures on women that is just unfair. Mm-hmm. So I, what part of the, the, the opportunity there is letting go of the self-image and focusing on the real bonds in your life and asking what is the best for these people. Mm-hmm. Because you should make decisions based not on what you want your self-image to be, you know, which, again, for women is just unbearable sometimes because there's too many demands on what perfection looks like. And they're not, it's not real perfection. Mm-hmm. You know, but instead, to see, you know, the real thing is aiming to build the bonds you have with those closest to you. Dr. Majors, we only have a couple of minutes, but can, you, can we end by you telling us about optimal work on your website, all the different ways that people can, can, can get, take advantage of, of your beautiful work? Oh, thank you. Uh, Optimum Work is a, is a platform that teaches people the entire approach to how to thrive on challenge. And so it's how do you build into your day reframing and recollecting yourself and setting positive challenges. 
practicing that at least an hour a day, trying to do one golden hour a day. And so we have a tool on Optimal Work that helps people to do this, a golden hour, where they set up their work a little bit in advance to the extent that they can. And that work could be the work in the home. It could be any kind of any kind of task, or it could be office work or even whatever. As long as you can think about it in advance and see how could you make it somehow more beautiful. How do you bring an image of 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 an ideal or you know into into this, or at least some skill that you can improve? We have a master class that could be done in as little as a month, and then it'd be like twenty minutes a day. And it's the kind of idea is people would start their day with the master class. And, uh, and then go that leads into their first hour of work. And we found that that is a complete program for growth. You know, and like week two on the master class is how to get out of threat mode. You know, when people are stuck in threat mode and with anxiety, the next, the next week is all about attention and learning how to attain your highest intensity of focus at will. And then the last week is about ideals and bonds, how to deal with burnout and how to find meaning in your work. Uh, so, um, I'm, I've been very happy with the response that we've, we've had now so many people go through the master class and we've gotten so much incredibly positive feedback about it. Um, we also, there's something on open work called the inventory, which is, it takes a few minutes to take, but it gives you a complete snapshot of how well you're thriving on challenges in your life. And we see how the master class makes a tremendous impact uh, as you can measure the growth that people have. So there's, there's a lot of things. OptumWork is continually looking to see how do we learn to help people grow faster? How do we remove any kind of friction? Ultimately, we want people to find it easier to thrive on every challenge in life. You know what's amazing, Dr. Majors? Mm. That the world is full of people like you who's, who are doing wonderful things for others and doing it professionally and, and in a way that can appeal to everyone and, and for the greater, greater glory of God. So I just, I congratulate you. And, well, um, and you. I thank you for your beautiful work. No, well, thank you, Grace. So that's so kind. Uh, no, I, I, I appreciate it. back to Conversations with Consequences. I'm your hostess, Dr. Gracie Christie, and today I'm so happy to have a friend and colleague joining me. His name is Dave Reinhardt. He worked for many years in D.C. and then became editor and columnist at the Oregonian newspaper in Portland. He was there for 22 years. Now he dedicates himself to freelance writing and editing. He's a fabulous editor. He's my editor. He works with us at the Catholic Association. He also edited my my husband's book. My husband recently wrote a book on pro-life arguments. I'm very proud of him. And it's a wonderfully edited book because Dave is very, very good at that. So thank you for joining us, Dave. You're very welcome. It's good to be with you, Gracie. Dave, we asked you to come on today because you have a special devotion to a prayer that we think should very much be highlighted during Lent, and it's the Litany of Humility. Now, many of our listeners probably are very well aware of it. May, maybe many of you read it and pray it during Lent especially, but I'd like to read it for all of our listeners before we start talking about it. O oh, Jesus, meek and humble of heart, hear me. From the desire of being praised, deliver me, O Jesus. From the desire of being preferred to others, deliver me, O Jesus. From the desire of being consulted, from the desire of being approved, from the fear of being humiliated, from the fear of being despised, from the fear of suffering rebukes, from the fear of being calumniated, from the fear of being forgotten, from the fear of being ridiculed, from the fear of being wronged, from the fear of being suspected, deliver me, O Jesus, that others may be loved more than I. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it, that others may be esteemed more than I. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it, that, in the opinion of the world, others may increase and I may decrease, that others may be chosen and I set aside, that others may be praised and I go unnoticed that others may be preferred to me in everything, that others may become holier than I, provided that I may become as holy as I should. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. Amen. Well, that's the litany of humility. 
What a wonderful uh, dive into the true meaning of the Christian life, isn't it, Dave? Oh, I think it is. It, it, uh, it's, it's, it's a beautiful prayer, and I think it is a prayer sometimes for our age, our age of self-esteem and branding and self-love and things that are presented as, as, as positive goods, but uh, we seem to be in the middle of a very unhumble age. And uh, this, is, this has been meaningful for me since I first learned of it in the mid-2000s. And uh, I know it's, it's been meaningful for others. It, in, in, in some way, it led me to leave the Oregonian, where I was an opinion writer. Opinion writers are not known terribly for their humility all the time. And uh, coming to embrace this this prayer, and I pray it I, I, for 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 years. I prayed it every every day, and moment by moment, day by day, sometimes hour by hour, it has uh, shaped me and confronted me. It's just been a true true blessing to me. Dave, reading through it, it it uh, it, it appears to me to refute all the. All the reasons that modern culture, our modern society gives us for happiness, to refute them as real sources of happiness. Because if we're being, if we're asking Jesus to grant us the desires of our hearts, and the desire of our heart is to lose that desire for praise, for inclusion, for for being um, admired, and also to, to lose that fear of being, as it says, uh, forgotten or ridiculed or wronged or suspected. What a countercultural message this is. And, and really a roadmap to true happiness. It really is. Your listeners should know, and I only know this secondhand, but I believe the source, who is a friend of uh, Justice Clarence Thomas's. I understand that the justice has a copy of the Litany of Humility on his wall in his uh, Supreme Court offices and has p- prayed it regularly and found it a great consolation. I imagine to, uh, if you're someone like uh, Justice Thomas, you have to be very firm in all the uh, all these virtues, right? To, to, oh, to, to yeah. go forward as he does every day against the current. Especially in coming out of the vicious assault on on him. That can harden a man's heart. He's gone to the right place with this litany of humility. I love the part that says that others may be chosen and I set aside. I think that might be one of the hardest challenges uh, to grasp as a Christian, the ability to let go of the desire to be first, to be chosen, to be noticed. Oh, I know. It's a deadly sin and to be, and, and, and the need to be reminded of it. I mean, there were different stanzas in each section that, that hit me sometimes more than others. One of them is that others, uh, that in the opinion of this world, others may increase and I may decrease. That's one that, that hits me pretty hard and is, is confronting. Of course, the language comes right out of John the Baptist when he uh, when mm. he saw saw Christ for the first time the other one that uh, confronts me is the desire to be consulted <laughs> uh, you, you know whether it as is as a, as a member of our of my family or as a political consultant which I was for years or certainly as a editorial writer and op-ed writer you want to be consulted and when you're not you still may want it and it still may not be good for you to still want it and uh, and there is true there is true happiness I, i'm not going to claim to be the personification of the litany of humility by any means <laughs> but over time and your listeners should know this if they don't already know it degree by degree it can change your outlook and make you more sensitive to the times when uh, you need to ask Jesus help in this. What I like about this prayer is that it puts into words uh, these uh, the things that we know are true. Like we know when we meet someone else, when we have someone in our lives who always has to be noticed, always has to be the center of attention, always has to be right, has to be consulted. We know that those people not only make themselves unpleasant and, and decrease the peace of their homes and their workplaces, but we know they're also unhappy. 
right? So right. we know that about other people, but we often don't understand that about ourselves and how we ourselves are doing that same, those same things to a certain degree or other. And, and that's why these people often bug us so much because they manifest something that we know is in us and needs to be confronted. And who better to confront it with than with Jesus? Mm-hmm. It's very beautiful. What a good thing for Lent, isn't it? It is. It is. Uh, I was intrigued by this because it was attributed and some claim written by Cardinal Raphael Mary Duvall, who was Secretary of State in the early part of the 20th century, Secretary of State of the Vatican. And I thought that he was interested in this because he was prey to great ambition. And, you know, maybe he wanted to, a higher office than Secretary of State. And I started to learn more about him. And in fact, I learned that it wasn't his prayer. He used a prayer that uh, was around, had been around for some time. And also, he was not a man who was known as ambitious. In fact, he was known as a person who was truly humble. He did not want the the office that he was given in 1900. He, in fact, he he lobbied against himself. He wrote a letter to the Pope saying, "Don't appoint me to this this office." He was just interested in being a pastor and 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 as he said, saving souls. He sounds like exactly the person you want to be in charge, right? Someone who has no yes. personal no personal uh, interest in the game. Exactly. Yes. It's easily found on the internet for people who are, are interested in it, and I, I recommend it thoroughly. If you're just joining us, we're chatting about the Litany of Humility with Dave Reinhardt, my friend and colleague at the Catholic Association. Dave, another thing that occurred to me is, as, as I was reading through the Litany, I've recently entered, well, not so recently, I just turned 52, so it's two years ago that I entered into my second half century. Sorry, I'm starting to see somewhat what it must be like as our energies diminish and we become the older generation and we start to be overlooked. And I have suddenly yes. a lot of sympathy for people who must retire because of age and take a step back and uh, all the different ways that age takes away from us our preeminent positions in, in our world, mm-hmm. in our world, whether that's professionally or personally at, at home. Don't you think that this litany is very useful for that state? I do, and I can resemble that remark I, uh, uh, because I'm a little older than 52. I'm 68, and my wife and I are, she's retired, and I'm kind of semi, semi-retired. And you do feel that, that the world has sometimes forgotten you or you don't have anything to contribute. And it's a challenge, and this will, I think, help to set your mind right there's a there's a line in the second section that talks about the fear of being forgotten Mm -hmm. there are so many of of us who can feel forgotten and do feel forgotten now there's a call on us to kind of remember these people and and also that we also we needn't be we didn't worry so much about being forgotten by the world if we can remember that we are we're remembered by jesus and that there's more to us than the things that this world would would give us and lavish on us now that we are uh, in the middle of lent and and as we approach the holy week i remember very much that Jesus himself walked the path of utter humility during his passion and and death. And that's another really good sign for us that that's the way to walk, is to walk the the path of humility. Well, it is. And in in that Last Supper, it always kind of amuses me and confronts me that Jesus has had to settle an argument uh, that the uh, that his disciples were were having about who was the first among them and he was saying no 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 
the person who is first will be the great servant. And uh, yes, Jesus was the great service, servant and, and humble, born in a manger, died with criminals, crucified with criminals. And uh, it doesn't get much more humble than that, thank God. We have a, a, a strange vision of I think of Holy Week of Jesus' um, end of his life on earth because we are seeing it after 2,000 years of Christian, of explosion of Christianity across the world. It's conquering of, of the world. And so we, we see the king up on the cross, but and we see him as the king, but I think we, we, we forget that really he was a naked, tortured man abandoned by all his friends, almost, um, right. um, yeah, suffering the most humiliating death that a person could suffer. Um, yes. In, in pure, yeah. like, sh in, in everyone watching, everyone in the world watching and, 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 and laughing at him. So yeah. I, I think it's important during Lent, and maybe you agree, to stop and, and remember that about the passion. Yes. Talk about the fear of being humiliated mm -hmm. and the fear of being despised. Yes, absolutely. So he yeah. lived it before us. Now, now, Dave, you are a convert, and I, I'm sure that that was a, a really spectacular path, as, as all the paths of conversion are. And I wonder if you uh, experience what converts do. And, and it doesn't just, I, and I don't think it happens just to converts from one religion to another or, or one branch of Christianity to another. But I think it happens to anyone who has a real life changing experience where, where they start to live their life in a, in a different way, a, a way that's congruent with their new, with their new world view. Uh, people reject you. People say, you're not the person that I'm used to. Why are you being so silly? Can we go back to our old ways? Did this happen to you? And could the litany of humility help converts? It, I think the litany of humility can help converts and indeed anybody. It didn't happen to me that much. I was I went through a period of non-religiousness. But by the time I, I had been religious, uh, well before I became a convert to the Catholic Church. Uh, I had been in the Methodist Church and in the Episcopal Church, and I finally made my way to Rome and have never looked back. I tell my wife often, even in her presence, that this is the only thing I've ever joined that I didn't want to almost immediately get out of, whether it was a fraternity, a football, and in fact... <laughs> <laughs> our, 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 our marriage. That's but, very common uh, in the first year of marriage, I must say, Dave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I just want, I won't want deeper into this. And I was always a little different in my social set, I guess. I was uh, the conservative on an editorial board that was very liberal. And I had been an academic uh, at one point in my life, and they're not known for their conservatism, at least uh, <laughs> in this way. So I had been, they, they knew who I was. I had some issues with my family, uh, they, and, and, and my, my mother and father. Uh, but that worked itself out through the love that existed before, during, and after. Do you think, though, so. that uh, that that often happens as a as a test, as it were, to to people who who find Christ? <laughs> they find oh, themselves I, challenged in their in their pride because people uh, refuse to accept them or they make fun of them. Oh, I do. I do think that crazy. And I think for me, the uh, a big challenge, which I won't go into here, uh, occurred while on, on multiple fronts while I was uh, in, the, in going to instruction. And it, 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 was a, it was a significant, manif multifaceted challenge. And uh, I think the devil tests you, and the evil one uh, wants, wants, wants you back. <laughs> <laughs> He's probably so, just, yeah. uh, I, I can almost imagine him rubbing his hands, waiting for that moment when the convert finally relaxes a little bit. <laughs> And he says, oh, okay, yeah. now I'm going to yeah. strike. <laughs> yeah, and it's not always going to be roses. And you're not always going to have these, you know, you're going to have periods of, of dryness. And the newness is going to wear off. And you're going to become a little aware of some of the warts in the institution. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, Dave, yeah. thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and insights today on the Litany of Humility. I hope that our listeners will be inspired to, to pray it during this Lent and allow all of our hearts to be transformed by the beautiful words. So thank you again, Dave, and, and also, of course, for all you do as my editor and as a wonderful colleague at the Catholic Association. God bless you and all you do. Every morning, the Catholic Association reviews all the latest news and sends our subscribers Subscribers, a carefully curated collection of the most important news of the day. Items are specifically selected for a smart Catholic audience like you. Don't let the world take you by surprise. Subscribe to our daily media roundup at thecatholicassociation.org. And now, Father Roger Landry offers us, as is customary, a short and inspiring homily to prepare us for this Sunday's Gospel. This is Father Roger Landry, and it's a joy to have a chance to ponder with you the consequential conversation God wants to have with us tomorrow on the first Sunday of Lent. It's a conversation which we eavesdrop on Jesus' dialogue with the devil in the desert, which Jesus invites us to journey with him for his 40 days there, to learn from him how to live well, not just Lent, but the entirety of Christian life. He seeks to strengthen us, not just to fight against the temptations of the evil one, but to choose and order our whole life to God. Permit me to say a few words first about going into the desert with Jesus. Most of us have no desire at all to go to the desert, certainly for no more than a brief visit. At a spiritual level, however, we should always have a great love for the desert because that's where the Holy Spirit drove Jesus and where he seeks to lead us each Lent. Without Jesus, the desert is sterile and lifeless, but with Jesus, it becomes a place of great vitality. We see this in the famous prophecy of Ezekiel, where the water from the temple trickles trickles down into the Arab desert and grows ultimately into a river, leading to all types of vegetation and aquatic life and restoring vitality even to the Dead Sea. That's a symbol of the living water from Christ's pure side that begins to well up in us through prayer and the sacraments. To go into the desert with Christ, therefore, is not a sterile exercise, but one that's meant to bring life even to those places within us that seem to be most lifeless. The problem, however, is that going into the state of the desert, even with Christ, is increasingly difficult for people today. Removing ourselves from distractions, from our cell phones, televisions, computers, car radio, newspapers, podcasts, social media scrolls, and the various things that crowd our lives with so much noise is increasingly difficult. We're so connected that if we're out of cell phone rage, we can easily feel lost. The first temptation we face each Lent is to resist or refuse to go into the desert with Christ, to think that our Lent can be complete if, for example, all we do is give up sweets and booze. The first big hurdle is to hear Christ's voice from the desert saying, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. Once we accept that invitation and journey with Christ into the state of the desert, Christ can begin to strengthen us. The details of his 40 days in the desert, including his temptations by the devil, could only be known if Jesus himself had divulged them. No one else was there. He very much wanted the details known so that we would be able in prayer to live them with him. Jesus prayed and fasted for an incredible 40 days, which obviously would have left him physically weak and famished. It was at precisely this moment of physical weakness that the devil came to tempt him. In the temptations Jesus suffered and later described, the devil brought out in a pristine form the types of temptations that Christ would later undergo in his public ministry and that each of us undergoes in life. By focusing on how Christ responded, we too can learn how to respond like he did. The first temptation was aimed right at Jesus' tremendous hunger after 40 days of eating nothing. If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become loaves of bread, the devil said. Jesus had come to save people to feed their most important hunger, the hunger of their soul. And Satan was trying to induce him, as Archbishop Sheen famously used to say, to become a baker rather than a savior. To feed people's physical hunger would be a great way to win a crowd and become popular. But Jesus himself was already living off a greater source of food and was preparing to train disciples to seek that same heavenly nutrition. Man, he says, does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. This same insight he passed on to the crowds when they were following him to have their stomachs satiated. Do not work for the food that perishes, he stated, but for the food that endures to eternal life that the Son of Man will give you. Lent is a time in which we refocus on working for the food that endures, in which we grow in our trust for God's provision, 
that he loves us more than the lilies of the field and the birds of the year, and that he will give us each day our daily bread. This is the means by which the devil will not be able to tempt us through our tummies. In the second temptation, the devil tried to tempt Jesus to test God the Father. He said, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down for it's written. He will command his angels concerning you to protect you. And with their hands, they'll support you lest you dash your foot against a stone. This is the temptation to be presumptuous with God, to do something reckless and make us expect God to rescue us from it every time, to recreate our relationship with God on our terms rather than on God's terms. Then when God doesn't seem to respond to that situation because such behavior harms us, the devil uses it to divide us even further from God. For example, some can smoke a pack of cigarettes for a decade and then expect God to cure us of lung cancer when we ask him politely in prayer. Jesus passed on to his disciples his response to the devil's temptation so that we can make it our own. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test, he said. Rather than presumptuously throwing ourselves down from precipices, Lent is a time in which we trustingly throw ourselves up into God's merciful, outstretched arms. In the third temptation, the devil presented Jesus with a vision of all the kingdoms of the world and said to him, chortling, all these I shall give you if you will prostrate yourself and worship me. Jesus was about to announce that his kingdom was at hand, but the father of lies was proposing a shortcut, another way, a supposedly easier way. The devil likewise tempts us to compromise our relationship with God in order to get ahead or to get what we want. He promises power, prestige, profit, or privilege. If only we compromise our relationship with him and his moral law in order to serve the ruler of this world. Jesus rejected this temptation, firstly saying, Get away, Satan. It is written, The Lord your God shall you worship, and him alone shall you serve. Jesus told us about this third struggle so that we would learn from him how to love, know, and serve God. God liberally extends to us the grace of conversion in Lent so that we might recognize our idols and turn away from them to love the true God, serving him with all our mind, heart, soul, and strength. How do we imitate and live Jesus' responses to the devil and grow in strength against diabolical temptation? Jesus tells us in St. Mark's Gospel that some devils are expunged only by prayer and fasting. That's why on Ash Wednesday, the church presents us the need to pray, fast, and give of ourselves in what we have toward others. The devil seeks to trick us to disorder our relationship to ourselves, to others, and to God. And fasting, almsgiving, and prayer are the respective antidotes. The more we fast and place spiritual nourishment over material food, the less vulnerable we will be to be tempted by bread and other earthly pleasures. The more we sacrifice ourselves and our belongings for the good of others, the less prone we'll be to giving in to the devil's seduction to give us power and control over others. The more we pray to God and seek to know and do his will in our life, the less assailable we will be to the devil's traps presumptuously to force God's hand. These three traditional Lenten practices of prayer, fasting, and almsgiving are a great remedy, a merciful medicine to the evil one's potent poison. And that's why we need to make bold resolutions in Lent with regard to all three. Lent is an annual spiritual desert boot camp the church gives us so that we might train with Jesus and following his example, be victorious in the most important battle we'll ever fight. And they all converge in the Mass which is supposed to be for us an oasis in the midst of a desertified world where we can be with Christ each day. It's there that we go to pray together with Christ to the Father. It's there that we arrive having fasted so that we might hunger for him and for what he hungers. It's there that we receive the greatest alms of all, Christ himself, and are made capable of living a truly Eucharistic life, giving in memory of him, Christ himself, together with our own body, blood, what we have and who we are. So let us head to the desert with Christ this Sunday as we receive the living water and blood flowing from his side, bringing us to life and strengthening us to live off every word that comes from his mouth, obeying rather than testing him and serving and loving him with all we've got. A blessed Lent. 
Thank you, Father Landry. To hear more from Father Landry, check out his website at catholicpreaching.com, and you can also catch his writings at EWTN's own National Catholic Register. A big thank you to all our listeners for joining us. I hope that this show was helpful. I hope that it gave you more peace and more hope and more joy, and you go with our prayers. 